Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you'll move on this listener right now in your gentle, loving, powerful, and merciful way as they listen to this message from All Nations Church in Tallahassee. Amen. Take your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 2. We'll get to the scripture in just a moment. It seems like this may be the longest message in the history of preaching, but we're going to keep talking about it until the Holy Spirit says we're done. Title is, This Is That, because those were Peter's words in Acts chapter 2, when the crowd thought that the 120 in the upper room must be drunk, or others were very confused about what was happening and what was going on. Peter rose to say, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And upon my servants and my handmaids, I will pour out of my spirit, says the Lord. So this is that. We are living in that moment today as well. We are living in a this is that moment for the church of Jesus Christ. I believe you and I can live with an anticipation that this could be the greatest day in the church age. The greatest day in the age of grace and Jesus Christ showing his mercy to you and me. It's funny though, when God begins to move in his church, it seems like the world tries to get darker. And the culture tries to come even more strongly against the truth of God's word. But it's not just the culture. You ready? It's those in the church as well. Those who really prefer a lukewarm faith, who prefer playing church, who prefer to have their ears tickled. But I assure you in this place, that's not going to happen as long as I'm your pastor. We're going to speak the truth and declare the word of God and let Holy Spirit deal with those who resist him. You know, we're living in a day of great deception. Those who don't know Christ are blinded through deception. The enemy has nothing real. All he can do is use deception to bring falsehoods and convince people that it's real. It's funny, isn't it? I mean, think about it for just a few minutes. It's funny how people trash God and then blame him for what's happening all around us. Kind of funny, isn't it? It's funny how we believe the media, but question what the Bible says. Funny, isn't it? It's funny when someone can say, I want to go to heaven, but I'm not going to change my life. I'm not going to believe in Jesus. I'm not going to offer my life as a living sacrifice. Funny, isn't it? Funny, isn't it? When someone can say, I believe in God while following Satan. By the way, he believes in God too, just so you, if you're not aware. It's funny, isn't it, how you can send a thousand jokes through email and they spread like wildfire, but when you start talking about Jesus and uplifting the Savior, all of a sudden it shuts down. Funny, isn't it, how the lewd, crude, vulgar, obscene pass for pass freely through cyberspace. It's amazing to me. They can't shut down porn on the internet. Yet they shut down preachers. We've actually had messages pulled from YouTube because they found the content offensive. And all I could say was praise God. The gospel should be offensive to those that are lost and deceived. It's funny how someone can be so fired up for Christ on Sunday and then be silent and invisible the rest of the week. Deception has blinded masses, not just those in the world, but even those in the church. People have chosen truth over lies. We're living in Isaiah 59, and if you've never read that scripture, you should read the whole chapter. It says people prefer murder and violence to grace and mercy. It says there's coming a time when uh, we will run to shed innocent blood. Living in a time when truth has fallen in the streets. So we ask ourselves, in this generation, is there any hope? Yes. Isaiah 59.1 says, the Lord's hand is not shortened, 
that it cannot save his ear is not heavy, that it cannot hear. Even in a day of deception, God is looking for a man, a woman, who will stand in the gap, who will raise the banner of Jesus Christ and still declare there's only one way to the Father, and that's through his Son, Christ Jesus. We live in a culture where many believe that what I say I am must be truth. I thought about that this week, and I thought, you know, I'm going to say I'm rich. And I believe there will be six zeros added to the back of my bank balance. Let me, let me check that right quick, okay? Bear with me just a minute. I'm not very good on the phone. It takes me a moment. Are you kidding me? It didn't change. But I said I'm rich. I said I'm handsome. But when I look in the mirror, I don't look like George Clooney. You see, it doesn't matter what we say. What matters is who we really are. A man can say he's a woman, but the truth is he's still a man. And a woman can say she's a man, but the truth is she's still a woman. We live in a culture where they want you to believe a man can have a baby. But what they don't tell you is that man was born a woman with a womb and reproductive organs, not born a man. It doesn't matter what you say. What matters is what's true. We live in a day and an age when mediocre athletes, I'm going to say that again, mediocre athletes can't win against men, so they claim to be women so they can win. And How, how ridiculous is that? It's, it's unbelievable, the day and the age in which we live. I said it last week, I'll say it again. It's not a matter of people who are deceived and pushing these lies, being ignorant. No, it's a matter of them believing things that simply aren't true. And I'm speaking to the younger generation right now. You must believe the word of God is absolute truth. You cannot believe what culture is peddling and think you're going to please God. Well, I don't want to offend anyone. If you're living righteously in Christ Jesus, you will cause people to pull back and be offended. Not because you're an offensive person, but because the Spirit of God that is in you irritates the demons that is in them, and they're going to be irritated and offended by God in you. So be it. But here's the good news. The God that is in you will also bring conviction to hearts and lives, and there will be those who turn and say, I want what you have. I want to know the God that you serve because he is real, he is powerful, he is consistent, he is faithful, and I see it in your life. Stop living to please people. Live to please the living God. But everybody says, it doesn't matter what everybody says. It matters what God says. It doesn't matter what everybody believes. It matters what God believes. Can I tell you, and I've said this many times, I'll say it again, sin makes you stupid. There's no other way to express it. Somehow you turn off your mental faculties and believe everything that comes from the pit of hell. God, help us, enlighten us, pull the deception off of our eyes, and let us see you clearly. In this day and in this age, Jesus said false teachers will arise. It's happening all around us. Do you realize the United Methodist Church just split over ordaining homosexuals as ministers? Why is that even an issue? You say, well, you know, we've got it. we do love them. We do want to reach them for Jesus, but it doesn't mean we give someone who's living contrary to the word of God an office, a place, and a voice in the pulpit. We stick to the truths of Jesus Christ. I was blown away. There's a young man who at one time came to church here. He was confused then. He's still confused. He sent me an email saying, I was a member of your church, which he wasn't. He came to church here. And then he wanted to say, and I was a member of, and I want to say it, Killarn United Methodist. And I'm withdrawing my membership from both places, and I'm going to this other church that is affirming to the homosexual agenda. God help him. God open his eyes. 
God let him see truth and reality. And it's not just one young man. It's multitudes who are believing the lies of culture. But when we come to the place where we understand a move of the Holy Spirit will first change us, and then our lives become visible to those around us, and by our lives, they're drawn to Jesus Christ. Then we understand why we need revival. Then we understand what God wants us to do. Someone said to me a couple weeks ago, you need to stop being political. Listen to me, I'm not political. The Democrats and the Republicans are both corrupt. Our government is corrupt. This is not about politics. It's about biblical truth and pure morality. And any time we are so touchy-feely in the church that we can't hear the truth and respond to the truth, it's time for us to hit the altar. Unfortunately, what often happens is people don't hit the altar. They hit the door. They say, I'm not coming back to that place. I'm going to go someplace where we can be affirmed in our sin. Show me that in the scripture, please. You're not going to find it because you made it up. Because it's a lie from the pit of hell. And if you don't come back and repent, you will not be in heaven. Well, that's harsh, Pastor. Yeah, it is harsh. But the time of the soft, easy gospel, the time of the seeker-sensitive message, the time when people can come in and their spirit not be disturbed by the Holy Spirit's conviction is a time to be gone and no longer in this house. Three things I want to share with you that are evidences of a move of the Holy Spirit. Number one, when the Holy Spirit shows up, there will be a call and a cry for repentance. Acts 2.38, after Peter had preached the sermon and said, you are the ones that crucified Jesus, the son of the living God. His blood is on your hands. You know what they said in verse 38? Said, what are we to do? And Peter said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He said, repent, and once you repent, then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You see, we've tried to shortcut that. We've tried to step across it. We've tried to act as, oh, no, you don't have to repent. Just come and confess. Just come and claim. Just come and declare. I'm telling you today, until we repent, we will not know the Father. Come and repent, and then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, when God moves, a cry for holiness arises in his church. Joel 2 verse 12 says, from the message translation, but there's also this, it's not too late. God's personal message, come back to me. Really mean it. Come fasting and weeping. Sorry for your sins. Change your life, not just your clothes. Come back to God, your God. And here's why. God is a kind and merciful. He takes a deep breath, puts up with a lot. The most patient God is extravagant in love, always ready to cancel catastrophe. Repent. Come back to God. Change your life, not just your clothes. Verse 15 of Joel 2 says, declare a day of repentance. Church, until we first repent. The world will not repent. Until so we first set the example and allow God to bring change into our lives, neither will the world be drawn to him. See, when Holy Spirit begins to convict people, and some in this room, some online, there is a sense of sorrow that invades our heart and our mind. But the sorrow that comes from the Holy Spirit doesn't bring condemnation nor hopelessness. Rather, the sorrow that comes from the Holy Spirit leads to repentance, and that repentance leads us to hope. There is hope for me. Well, I've come to tell you this morning, it doesn't matter where you've at, what you've done, where you're sitting right now, there is hope for you, and the gate that opens hope is repentance. It's repentance. Our repentance needs to be because we need hope in our life. Without hope, we are lost. We are doomed for an analysis. We are doomed. Let's just put it that way. Our hope is none other 
than Christ himself. 2 Corinthians 7, verses 8 through 10. The apostle wrote it this way, and I'm just reading verse 10. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. The sorrow that leads to repentance brings life. The sorrow of the world brings death. You see, we need to understand that Godly sorrow doesn't mean that I'm sorry I got caught, that my sin was exposed, that my hypocrisy came to light. I'm sorry for that. No, godly sorrow means not only am I sorry for my actions that I've sinned against God and others that have broken his heart and the heart of others, but it means that I will turn away from that action and never embrace it again. That, my friend, is repentance. It's not simply saying, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. No, it's allowing the power of the Spirit of God to move you from that place and that position and give you power over that sin. That's true repentance. Turning away, not confessing away. Let me say that again. Repentance is turning away, not confessing away. And for far too long, we have embraced confession because we have heard the old adage, confession is good for the soul. Well, that may be true. Confession cannot and does not take the place of repentance. Godly sorrow produces repentance. And godly sorrow brings change into our hearts and into our lives. Listen, I am convinced that for years, maybe generations, we have missed the outpouring of the Holy Spirit because we haven't taught people the primary thing in your walk to know Jesus is to repent of your sins. To turn away from that lifestyle. Someone said, well, you don't really like homosexuals. That's not true. I love them. But I have an imperative to tell the truth. And the truth sometimes offends. But any time someone, regardless of their gender identity, turns their life to Jesus Christ in true repentance, you know what you're going to see? You're going to see them turn their life away, around and walk away from that which has held them captive. We need to understand repentance breaks the hold of the enemy over our lives. So long we've missed an outpouring of the Spirit. We come to the altar week after week. We make confessions, but we never repent. We never say, God, forgive me. Change me. Pour your Spirit out upon me. Listen to me. God cannot and will not pour His Spirit out on unclean vessels. We must confess and repent. Not merely confess, because God doesn't use dirty vessels. Holiness always precedes happiness. First John 1 John 1.9, the writer said these words, If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. Tie it to the first. He cleanses us from that act that caused us to repent. That's the way the gospel works. It's not simply about signing a card, saying a little prayer, confessing your need, and then walking out. It's about repentance. And until we repent, starting with the church, we will never see everything that God wants for us. It's time to repent. It's time to repent. Luke chapter 3, verse 8, the writer said, Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. You know what he was telling the Jews in this passage? He was saying, I don't care about your pedigree. It doesn't matter. You may be a son of Abraham, but that's immaterial. Until you repent and bear fruits of repentance, your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life. You know, I grew up in western Oklahoma, and I'll never forget the kid that I went to high school with. We also worked the same part-time job through high school. And he was as ornery and mean and nasty as they came. His mouth would put a sailor to shame. The things that he did on Friday and Saturday night would cause your hair to curl. I'll never forget that. He, and I wasn't saved. I wasn't a Christian. But I knew he wasn't either. I judged him by his works. And they were from the devil. 
I'll never forget the day I said something or he said something. He said something about going to heaven. I kind of, what? Yeah, I'm going to heaven. Really? Your life doesn't look like it, Wayne. He said, no, you don't understand. I went to the altar when I was a little boy and I asked Jesus to come to my heart. So I'm all good. I'm going to heaven. What a life from the pit of hell. Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Change your life, not just your clothes. Listen, your relationship with Christ is proved in your actions. What good is a confession if there's no action to go along with it? What good is saying, I'm sorry, if you don't change what you've done? It's all empty words. Thank you, Haley, for that song. It's all empty words. Words spoken in vain have no validity, no value. Confession must be accompanied with repentance, with the turning away, with the changing of the way we think and the things we do. When the Holy Spirit begins to move, there will be a call for repentance. Number two, when the Holy Spirit begins to move, there will be an opportunity for restoration. Joel chapter 2 verse 25 says, So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. You see, God's desire is to restore you, to make you whole, to let the image of His Son live within you completely and totally. Someone said to me, well, does that mean that the consequences of my previous life are gone? Hardly. Hardly. Now, God in his mercy at times can remove those consequences as you repent. But often the choices that we have made while we live in sin and the consequences of those choices follow us through life. Listen, folks, we need to understand that we cannot play with the devil and not get burned. You cannot tolerate and play patty cake with Satan and not be scarred by that relationship. But when you come back to God, God offers restoration, restoration of your heart, restoration of your mind. He wants to renew you, restore you. He wants to change the way you think. He wants to change what you feel. He wants his image to be confirmed and conformed in you so that he can be honored and glorified. God desires for all of us to be restored in right relationship with him. But he's left the choice up to us. You know, if I was God, I wouldn't leave me a choice. I would say, this is what you're going to do, buddy. But that's not the way he is because he's gracious, he's loving, he's kind. He doesn't force himself or his will upon anyone. Rather, he woos, he convinces, he convicts, he draws by the power of the Spirit so that we come to the place that we acknowledge, I need some restoration in my life. You see, when restoration begins to occur, those old vices begin falling away. Someone said, well, I've been drinking alcohol my whole life. I can't stop. Nonsense. God can restore you. He can renew you. He can change your mind so that that craving, that habit, that desire is no longer there. The prodigal son is a perfect illustration of restoration. He wasn't happy with his home life. He deserved more. So he said to his father, give me my inheritance. You know the story, the parable of the prodigal son. And he went and it says he squandered every penny in the bars, in the houses of ill repute, buying friends with money, not making friends out of relationships. Until one day he ran out of money and he got a job feeding the pigs and he realized he's eating the same thing the pigs eat. How disgusting is that? And he came to himself, the scripture says, and he said, I'm going to go home to my father, simply ask to be his servant because his servants have a better life than I have. You know the story, right? The father saw him when the scripture says he was yet a long ways off. He opened his arms and ran towards him. He brought him to his bosom. He is his son. That never changed. He's his son. And he restored him. 
Now, he didn't get everything he'd lost because that was already gone. But he regained the relationship with his father that he so desperately needed. The invitation to come home was always open. But listen, he had to hit rock bottom before he had accepted it. And so often that's the way of those who have been in the church and around the church. They knew the Father, they knew the Son, but the lure, the draw, the temptation of the world was so strong, they walked away. They found themselves living in the pig pen, eating what the pigs ate, and suddenly they came to a revelation, it's better for me to go back and be his servant than for me to live like a pig. And when they do... There's restoration. There's restoration. It doesn't matter what caused someone to turn away. What matters is you come to the realization that the way of God is much better than the way I've been living. Just like you and I, the prodigal son had a choice to make. To intentionally return towards God. And when he did, God in his mercy chose to pour out his spirit in a wonderful way. I'm so glad God doesn't think like I do. I'm so glad God doesn't see things as I do. I'm so glad that God has a different plan and a different approach in dealing to those with those who have failed him. His approach is mercy. His approach is grace. His approach is forgiveness. His approach is no condemnation. I'm thankful that he's greater. He's more powerful. He is able to do that which we, you and I as humans, simply can't do. So listen, here's the point. You know what separates us from God? Unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, feeling offended separates us from God. Can I tell you this morning, stop it. Repent of it and be restored to the mighty heavenly Father. Because Philippians 1, 6 still tells me, He who began a good work in you will perform it until His appearing. In order for us to be a part of that last big move of God before Jesus comes back, we have to be restored in right relationship with Him. And in a move of God, there's always opportunity for restoration. Haley, would you come back, please? Number three, when God begins to move, there will be an outpouring of power. Joel 2.28 makes it so clear. It shall come to pass afterward. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Acts 2, 1 through 4 is the fulfillment of that prophecy where it says that when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided or cloven tongues as of fire and one set on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Oh, come on, church. It's time to stop running from Pentecost and run toward Pentecost. It's time to recognize the power that enabled the disciples to walk the road they walked, to live the life they lived, to die the deaths they died was the power of the Holy Holy Spirit that only comes from a great outpouring. You say, well, I don't want to talk in tongues. Get over yourself, submit yourself to God, and let His power flow in your life. Let His power flow in your life. But here's the problem. We come to church and all we're looking for is a manifestation. I love that song, We Want a Real Encounter. Because it's not just about manifestations. It's about encountering Jesus Christ and allowing God to move in our lives. Here's the problem. When all we seek is the miracle, the signs, the wonders, the manifestation of the power of God, then we start worshiping the manifestations and we miss the one who sent them. We miss the one who authored them. We miss the one who made them occur and made them happen. Matter of fact, Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 26, You followed me because you ate the bread, not because you saw the signs. 
See, too often we identify just in our flesh with what God is wanting to do rather than letting his spirit take our spirit, our mind, our body, our soul to a whole new level of his grace and his mercy. When we begin living in this is that, God pours his power out upon all people. God touches us in a powerful way. Listen, it's not about the manifestations. It's not about being slain in the spirit or speaking in tongues. It's not about the miracles, the signs, the wonders. It's about Jesus. Jesus. What did Jesus say to his disciples in Mark 16? He said, you'll go into all the nations and preach the gospel. To him who believes and is baptized, they'll be saved. To him that believes not, they'll be damned. Then these signs shall follow. It always follows the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we lift Jesus up first, then we're not drawn to manifestations. We're drawn to Christ. And when we're drawn to Christ, our entire life goes inside out, upside down, revolutionized by a greater power than we've ever experienced as God pours out his spirit in this last day listen to me it's going to be for the lost church we've been sitting around playing patty cake singing songs about power when we don't have enough power to blow our nose we were talking about power when it doesn't exist the last day outpouring of power will be for the lost to bring men and women to Jesus Christ. That's why it's imperative that you and I are full of the Holy Ghost so that we can go out and speak the gospel to those who have never heard and they believe and accept Christ as their Savior. I don't want to stand in heaven and watch that great white throne judgment. And hear people say, Steve Dow, you knew this was true? And you never said a word to me? You let me go to hell? You let my life for eternity be run? I will not do that. Oh God, bring power to change lives. Bring power to set men free. Bring power to bring the sinner to repentance. You see, power is never an end to itself. It's always used to show Jesus Christ, to prove who he is. And if we're ever going to live in this is that, if we're ever going to experience that great out day, outpouring of the last days, we've got to come to the place where we will humble ourselves as a church and repent where we will cry out for restoration and we will recognize our need of God's power. Stand to your feet with me. Haley and the worship team are gonna sing this song. It says, we want revival now. Here's the altar call. It's very simple, very direct. Number one, you need to repent. You should be the first down. Number two, you need restoration. You should be right on their heels. Number three, you want to experience God's power through your life, then you need to be following them. So right now, as they begin to sing, we want revival now. You begin to respond. The altar is open. This is between God and you. I've done my part. He's doing his part. Now it's up to you. Will you respond or will you sit in your seat, stand in your place, immobile, refusing to change because I don't need it or I'm afraid someone will think something about me oh come on church get over yourself and respond to the spirit of God we need revival now sing it out you made it to the end of the message and now what is God leading you to make a change are you needing a good church home where you can grow and help others grow as you fulfill your part in the body of Christ then we invite you to join us at all nations church on Sharer Road in Tallahassee, a multicultural church founded on the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. Our Sunday morning service is at 1030 and Wednesday night service at 7, plus youth group and kid power and small groups and more. For more information, visit our website, allnationstallahassee.com.